and start. So welcome, everybody. Uh, <laughs> this is another episode of Let's Develop. I'm Chris Woolley, your host. And today we've got uh, Lisa Guchara here looking at photographing the old, the everyday, and the imperfect. If this is your first time watching Let's Develop, welcome. Uh, this is an educational webinar series sponsored by American Color Imaging. Uh, basically, we've got a brand new photographer every two weeks that's sharing information that's relevant to photographers in our community. Uh, so we just got a dripping whole, whole bunch of information uh, coming out there. So uh, a shout out to uh, ACI American Color Imaging uh, for bringing on this program. If you missed our last episode, uh, Lucy Dumas was on with IPS Super Sales. Uh, so how she's selling multiple pieces of wall art and albums. Uh, that uh, replay is live on ACI's website. So you can check it out there as well as all of the other episodes that we've done before. So that's kind of exciting. So if this is your first uh, time here, uh, we've got a chat that's on the right side of the screen. So you can actually ask questions. Lisa can answer them live for us, either during the program or after, depending on how relevant it is there. Um, so make sure that you're typing those questions in to the chat on the side of them. Also, at the very, very end of the program, we do have some prizes and giveaways from ACI. So uh, make sure that we're looking out for those. All right, so now let's get into uh, our, our speaker, Lisa. Uh, and she is crazy, crazy talented. I'm sure many of you have seen her before. Uh, she's got a PhD, Master Craftsman, Master of Photography, Honor ANEC. She's super passionate about photography, enjoys both being behind the lens and in the digital darkroom, loves to photograph nature, but finds many subjects equally intriguing. Lisa and her husband, Tom, are known for their expertise in photography and in Photoshop and for their inspiration and informative photography photography workshops, uh, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> uh, Lisa's created numerous award-winning images and enjoys sharing her vision, passion, and her knowledge. Her photographs have been in the Adirondack Life, uh, Wild Bird, Birder's World, and Calendars on the cover of uh, paperback novels, galleries, exhibitions, and in the PPA Loan or Image Excellence Collection now. Uh, Lisa and Tom have also published two books with Amherst Media, uh, Create Fine Art Photographs from Historic Places and Rusty Things, and The Frog Whisperer. You can check out uh, Lisa and Tom and their photography classes, photo tours, workshops, and all of that at uh, photography by Tom and or by Lisa and Tom dot com. Photography by Lisa and Tom dot com. That's going to be in. Uh, oh, you put it in chat because you're. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Lisa, on that one. Uh, but uh, I'll also send it up in the follow-up email, so everybody's got that, too. So you've got it in multiple places. So, uh, uh, Lisa, what do you have for us today? Great. So thank you, Chris, for having me. So um, first of all, um, all of the images that you'll see tonight are images that both my husband and I have taken. So I met Tom in a camera club. So we're lucky enough to be able to share this passion together. Um, we have a wide variety of interests. So if you happen upon our website, you'll see that we love animals and we love macro work. We love abandoned locations. We have a whole genre, you know, many genres of work that we do. Probably the only thing we don't do is storms. We don't do hurricanes, tornadoes, none of that. That's probably the only genre that we don't uh, enjoy being able to, to do. So this particular program tonight is kind of specialized into both a type of photography and kind of a, a way of thinking. So wabi-sabi can be more than just um, what you're photographing, but it can actually be a philosophy. Um, it originated as the Japanese art of imperfect beauty. And as photographers, we usually seek out perfect beauty. If you watch, uh, you know, imaging and you look at the competitions in IPC, if you look in art galleries, in general, we seek out perfection. And we're going to see something very different with Wabi Sabi in that we're looking at things that might not be perfect. And as I said, it can translate into a way of life that focuses on kind of finding the beauty, no matter what's happening in the world or in your life or that day that you go out for that particular photo uh, shoot itself. I think we all need some of that right now, right? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, hopefully it will be something that will kind of open your eyes up a little bit to a different type of photography. Um, and maybe you inspire you. Maybe you're somebody that doesn't like the colder. Uh, you know, we asked everybody what the temperature is where you're at. Maybe you don't like the colder you know, temperatures and you do more of your photography inside. Maybe, you know, the pandemic has got you down. Maybe there's just times where, you know, you need to be able to think about a different type of subject. So hopefully this will open your eyes and you'll be able to come away with this with a, a appreciation for things that might be in your garage or in your basement or in an old relative's house. 
The first part of it I'm going to talk about is going to be looking at flowers. And generally, when we think about photographing flowers, we look for specimens that are perfect. We look for things that don't have any blemishes. As soon as they're past prime, we throw them away. I'm going to encourage you not to throw them away. Um, as a matter of fact, at one point, our pet sitter, we have three dogs, a cat, lots of frogs and chameleons. And our pet sitter said, you know, you have a lot of dead flowers around. You know, I don't mind while you're gone. We can throw some of them away for you. And I thought, no, no, you know, we're saving these for projects. Um, one of the pictures in here is a flower that was actually, um, it's over three, actually now this is the fourth Christmas. I got it um, as a Christmas present. And it was sitting around for three years before I photographed it. So it's looking at things that, again, we might turn a blind eye to and not really think about. So other people are saying they have dried uh, flowers that are hanging around. So absolutely, it's a wonderful uh, thing to be able to, you know, have a different appreciation for it. Certainly during the beginning of the pandemic, when I, Tom and I weren't going out in, you know, beginning of 2020 there, we had, when we got our flowers, we tried to make the best of them. So we certainly had flowers in all different types of, you know, brand new that we would get. And then ones in various states of decay as well. I certainly love photographing beautiful things. Tom and I are always seeking out wonderful backgrounds and perfect subjects. So we don't differ from the general photographer in that sense. It's just once those flowers start to lose their petals and wilt, we love them just as much. So a calla lily is beautiful in its prime, but what happens when it's lost all that chlorophyll? What happens when it's dried up and decayed? I find it equally beautiful. So what I did during uh, COVID is basically we canceled all our trips and we were home as many people were in March and April of 2020. And we transformed all of our horizontal surfaces in the house into little photo studios. So we dragged <laughs> out all our light boxes. We, um, I, we have three light boxes. So I have an old slide box. How many people have an old slide box that's sitting around in their attic in their basement? Drag that old slide box out. So if you have an old light box, you know, put that in the chat that you have that because I'm going to show you things like this that you can use that for. I also have a nice uh, daylight five, you know, 5,500, uh, you know, K, a nice, wonderful, you know, color calibrated light box that I use for certain things, but I don't want to scratch that up so much, right? So that old light box may be something that you can pull out. And then I also have a three foot by four foot, wonderful do it yourself, somebody made for me light box. So the light box you can use by putting it behind your subject, such as this calla lily. And then you want blinkies, right? We've been taught blinkies are bad. If you, you know, went from film to digital, you were taught that. As soon as you got your first digital camera, you were taught blinkies are bad. For high key subject, blinkies are good. We want the whites to actually be white. We want our subject not to have blinkies, but we actually do want the whites in this case. And that is one thing with those old um, light boxes, they often aren't quite as even. Maybe there's some, you can see kind of some where the bulbs are. So you actually purposely want to overexpose your picture to get a nice clean white background. So some other people said they have light boxes. So pull those out during these cold winter months. There's all kinds of fun things that you can do with them. I love them like this, just high key, straight out of camera. And if you actually look on our website, about half of the pictures that Tom and I take are pretty much straight out of camera. Um, maybe we did a small crop because we tend to like the four by five ratio. Um, you know, we might have, you know, bumped the clarity up a little, but about half of our pictures are straight out of camera. The other half, like anything goes, hey, 300 layers, Photoshop, I'm game. <laughs> so we basically believe in we're the artists, we get to pick what we want. So I love this straight out of camera, but I also love it being putting uh, textures on it and color blend modes on it and twirling it and doing fun things with it as well. So you'll see, um, you know, both, both of those types of genre in our photography. This program is probably more about straight out of camera, but you'll see some definite Photoshop in there. And I'll talk about that as it comes along too. You can do this on, you know, a, a low key background as well. So one of the areas that I set up was just a cheap poster board, you know, $5 from Staples. They have those scientific poster boards that you can get. So um, I just had a low key setup in addition to all these high key setups there. But as the tulip started to come in in March and April, as the petals started to dry up and wilt and fall off, it was almost like these flowers are taking on their own personalities. So they came in all identical almost like the Stepford Wives. And then the, as they aged, they showed their inner beauty and revealed that beauty in there. So it was really interesting to be able to photograph them. I tended to like the high key because the light kind of almost became, you know, translucent where the, you know, the petals were translucent on there. So I did a lot of this high key. And again, most of the time my light box is standing upright my subject, and then my camera. But I also could actually put that light box down as well. So I had the option of being able to do lay flat. 
So as I said, I have three light boxes. So in general, one was lying on the table and the other two were in an area where I could actually prop them up. When you do lay flat, it's so much fun because you can take any kind of subjects and put them on there. Uh, for most of the subjects I was using, just the light from the light box was enough. But occasionally I would photograph something like sunflowers or broken glass where I would actually need a little LED light. So I would use a little LED light for some fill light. But I would say 90% of the time the light was coming just from these light boxes here. You could use a wide angle lens like the last picture. You could use a macro lens like this picture. So you have a lot of different ways that you can photograph these subjects. The same subject you could photograph day after day because it looks so different day one than day three. So you get a lot of bang for your buck when you kind of get these subjects in. It seemed to me that the tulips were almost taking on personalities. They started looking like dancers. They started looking really interesting. And they started to me looking like just different personalities. Like this one to look like a ballet dancer, just nice and serene. So I brought this one into Photoshop and it was like, shall we dance? And the two tulips kind of come together. And in the next move, they kind of pull apart in that dance. So they started taking on like personalities and stories. And it started to get fun to be able to kind of assign a genre to uh, each one of the flowers as it came in. The lilies came in and when they dried, they certainly didn't look like delicate ballerinas. They looked to me more like Russian dancers and I could hear a different type of music in there. So I actually brought those into Photoshop and I inverted the background on these. So these were taken on a light box, but then in Photoshop, I inverted the background. And now these two dancers are coming together and you can hear a very different tempo to the music. And then they go apart, but their elbows are still connected there. So it was just so much fun to be able to see what would happen when I photographed them throughout different days as they got older and older. And then as I manipulated them in Photoshop as well. The irises that I got, I wasn't able to photograph them the first day that I got them. If you've ever had cut irises, I don't know if any of you have a garden, but our garden is basically designed so we can bring the flowers in and photograph them. <laughs> but in March and April, we were you know, relying on the farm that was down the road from us. So the irises, as soon as they came in, they started to dry and twirl and they were very different than the tulips, which took much time to be able to uh, kind of dry and deteriorate. So when I brought that one in, it was like I got something out of Pirates of the Caribbean. It was just like those colors were like underneath the ocean and so much fun that was coming from them. So you never knew what you were going to get straight out of camera and then manipulating it. You never knew what you were going to get there. So I had a lot of fun kind of creating this. So we went in March from being stuck at home to no, no, we're safe at home to wait, this is our artist in residence period. We finally have time to do all the things at home that we would normally like to do. So as I said, if this winter you're not a cold weather fan, get those light boxes out and you know, uh, maybe you're not using the dining room table for big gatherings right now. I've kind of taken over our dining room table. So you can use them to be able to photograph flowers and anything that's really sitting up on your mantle as well. So I have a few different definitions of wabi-sabi in this program, but this one's probably my favorite. And it's wabi-sabi is a wonky homegrown carrot. You're going to see that a lot of the photograph, uh, a lot of the subjects Tom and I photograph are wonky. A crack in a ceramic bowl, a well-thumbed book, a falling cherry blossom, a worn wooden hallway. It's an appreciation of all that is simple and modest and imperfect. So this particular tulip was taken through a piece of uh, glass. So I had gone a couple of years ago to a local stained glass place. And a lot of the pieces that they have left over, they will sell to you. Um, I paid to have the edges rounded. You could put gaffer's tape on them as well, but they are sharp. So I paid to have them uh, rounded off. And you can now photograph through all these different types of glass. You can have iridescent glass, or in this case, rippled glass. So it's a lot of fun to be able to now add that to your thing as well. So now I have the light box. I have my tulip. Up, I have this piece of rippled stained glass and then my camera that's there. So that's another thing that you can do that can be a lot of fun as well. So wonky. Um, I love photographing subjects that are wonky. Um, this particular one is Tom's. And you can see here that this poppy is kind of like do, 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 whoop, and then it's kind of going back up again. So it's kind of like the stem has gone for a walk. When we're looking for subjects, we're always looking for ones that are different. We're looking for the ones that are wonky. I get people that email me. I'm about to go to a sunflower farm, a daffodil farm, a tulip farm, a dahlia farm. Where do I start? And I say, look for ones that have personality. Look for ones that are wonky. It's something I do even if I go to the grocery store. I'm looking for that one tulip that's just opening up its petal and inviting you to be able to photograph. And it's different than all the other tulips out there. 
The other thing that you can do is have one of those cheap squirt bottles you can get at the dollar store, like two for 99 cents. And now you have some water that you can squirt on your subjects as well. Now, if you're going into a public garden, you need to like ask permission. You know, <laughs> some places like it, some places don't like when you squirt your water on there. But I do know I've seen a few people with their camera vests and they have that squirt bottle kind of, you know, stuck in the pocket of their camera vest. I always ask. Um, I want to make sure if I'm in a public arena, but in my home, I can squirt as much as I want to. <laughs> The other thing I'm looking for are things that are different. So this particular uh, tulip was up at a local park, Elizabeth Park. And when I walked in there that morning, I was the only person there beside the docent. And about an hour later, in walks a grandmother with her granddaughter. Granddaughter's about eight years old. And she walks in and she goes, OMG, which just cracked me up because like I text that, but I don't necessarily say OMG. So it cracked me up. She was just in awe. She loved it. Her grandmother's ecstatic. Kids happy. About 15 minutes later, the granddaughter's like, okay, grandma, like we've seen this, like, where are we going next? Well, I hadn't gotten around yet. So I said to the granddaughter, I said, there's one tulip in here that's half yellow, half orange. I said, you need to look at every flower and find it. About an hour later, I heard her, grandma, I found it, I found it. So her grandmother kind of winked and thanked me as she left out of there. But that's one of the things we have to do as photographers. We have to stop and slow down and notice things. Sometimes we do go to a place and maybe we don't want to lug our tripod with us and we just kind of go in and we don't get into the moment. The tripod's not just to make our image steadier, it's to make us slower, to make us appreciate things like this. Maybe if I hadn't had my tripod with me that day, maybe I wouldn't have noticed this flower. So it's one of those things that kind of train your eye on and to train yourself to see details in there as well. I also look for things like this, wonky, right? We have these, you know, kind of, you know, conjoined twins. We're actually seeing more and more of these in our flower community now. I'm not exactly sure why, but they're certainly on the increase. So if you can find something like this, how fascinating. And usually the two, just like twins, have completely different personalities. I found this particular one at Longwood Gardens. I was doing a program for a camera club down there at the end of October. When I found out that there were only 15 minutes from Longwood Gardens, I said, well, I'm definitely taking my camera. I'm going. But there wasn't a lot of flowers in bloom at that time and their holiday things hadn't been in yet. So I photographed this and I thought, wow, if this isn't the epitome of Wabi Sabi, we have this one blossom in the peak. And then we have all these ones that are five and 10 years older as we go up and up the stem. So it was really fascinating to be able to find this particular one. Um, this one was actually photographed using focus stacking. So the background was really distracting. So I needed to focus it at F2.8 and then focus stack it where each one of those individual blossoms would be in bloom. Tom and I also do a lot of nature photography and Wabi Sabi kind of is a philosophy that kind of connects us more with nature. It makes us again, slow down, notice things and the lifestyle that you're going to have can make you more connected to nature. And it's kind of fun because as you're out there with a big lens, say photographing, you know, eagles or vultures or whatever you're out there photographing, you're also seeing other things that are around there. So I was out there a couple of weeks ago and this eagle is uh, coming in. And then I noticed as they're you know, waiting for the next kind of birds to be able to happen this in the sidewalk and I'm like hey this looks like a bird it's got two eyes it's got a little beak it's got some fluffy little feathers so I love pareidolia I love seeing inanimate objects kind of come to to life and I get a kick out of now people have started to know me and they send me images through Facebook or email or text and they send me images as they go out and about so this particular day, I was about to go and photograph um, a pink Cadillac, and I'm walking past the building on my way to this pink Cadillac, and I'm like, oh, like there's Paradoia, there's Jimmy Durant, I gotta go stop. So I've got all this gear with me, I'm about ready for it to get dark, I'm gonna have one camera kind of doing star trails after I light pink this pink Cadillac, I've got another one, we're gonna do Milky Way, I've got all this stuff, and I had to stop. And I had to be open to the fact that this thing was just screaming at me, inspiring me to come and photograph it with the big nose and the eyes and the you know, expression that it has. So I love finding pareidolia. I love finding these inanimate objects. This is at a prison out in West Virginia, and every one of the cells in one particular ward had the sink in it, and the sink had this face in it. And I can just imagine every day waking up to this judgment of why'd you do that? You know, how did we end up in here? We should have taken a different path. And, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, uh, when you stranded on an island with a volleyball, you know, you have this, this, this face talking to you and kind of judging you in a way. And it was so interesting to be see every one of the cells had one of these faces in it. So pareidolia 
is basically if you think of like the inkblot test, if you think of looking up in the sky and you see a bear, it's basically you see things that are really not supposed to have a pattern, but they do have a pattern. Like this guy here smoking a cigar at the airplane graveyard. And it's kind of fun to be able to see. Um, Cindy was with us at an old car yard and she saw all kinds of things. And she's like, what about this face? What about this face? What about this face? The more you start to notice faces, the more you will notice faces. So this particular uh, workshop we were at, we found a cat and we found a mouse. So you never know what you're going to find when you're going about. As you start to see them, you'll notice them more. You notice them out in nature. There can be leaves that are like this. You can actually find all kinds of cool things just randomly, right? Those two eyes. Without that, the nose and the mouth wouldn't have really made, you know, made it. But those two eyes made this leaf have a face in addition to the acorn and that little pine needle. In the fall, you get all kinds of things like this little guy with this expression and the hair going on. You get rusty metal giving you smiles and fun things like that. This little dog here, um, this particular owner of this car yard kind of kind of like, well, why do you guys want to photograph this stuff? Like, it's just a bunch of old junk and we use it for parts to make like nice old cars, you know, new, new old cars. And he didn't quite understand why we wanted a photograph in his yard. And I said, would you like some pictures? And he said, I've looked at this stuff every year for like 40 years. Why do I want any pictures? But I still, we made him a canvas. We picked our nine favorite images and this was one of the nine. And we gave him the canvas and he said, I know where that dog is. He says, I've lived here for 40 years. I've never seen it, but let's walk over here. I can tell you based on that color red, it's on this particular car. And he walked us over there and he actually did put the canvas up above his uh, mantle. And he said, I finally get like why you guys want to come to our old car yard. So it was kind of fun. Pac-Man that you could find in an industrial building. So that could be interesting as well. Um, it's just something that makes you happy, right? It's kind of silly that you can see paranoia, but it can actually make you happy. And that's what our photography should be. It should be fun. The first time that we trip the shutter and we photograph, you know, a person, an animal, a bird, whatever that subject was, the first time you had so much fun out of it. And then you decided to get better. So you joined a camera club or you joined PPA, or you got a mentor and you said, I'm going to get better. And you continued striving. We should all be always lifelong learners. But all of a sudden, maybe there wasn't quite so much fun in it, right? It became something that we were starting to photograph for the competition or for the judges. Or we started to, you know, realize, well, our stuff isn't really so good. You know, you go through that process where everything is good and then everything sucks and then everything is good again. So, you know, you go through those phases that, you know, it kind of takes the fun out of it. It can be really difficult sometimes. You try to post your stuff on social media and you get, you know, a few likes and you go, why don't I have more likes? Well, you're competing with millions and millions of other images out there. So how do you compete with those images? You don't. You're shooting for yourself. You're shooting because it was fun. And I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we realize that we have to make money or we have to do competition or we have to you know, get likes. We have to have something that has significance in it. But we do it because we love photography. That first time we tripped the shutter and maybe it was a completely blurry bird, but it's still like your favorite bird picture. Or maybe the sunset was right in the middle. How many of you have a picture of a sunset and it's like right smack in the middle and you look at it now and you laugh, right? You used to love that picture. Um, I have one that's framed and it's the 16 by 20, the horizon's crooked, the sun's at the right in the middle. It's, you know, but oh, the time I loved it, right? Then you start looking at it and go, oh, it's not quite so good anymore. So it becomes difficult. So is it, cre you know, killing your creativity? Well, it's not perfect. Oh, it's not good enough for competition. Oh, I might not get enough likes on social media. So then we start kind of shooting for, you know, other reasons rather than ourselves. And that becomes really difficult. We got to remember that initial love that we have. Now, I definitely believe in competition. I've just earned my uh, master's from PPA. So I have my third degree this year. I definitely have gone through competing within NECCC and PPA and PSA. But again, shoot the images you love. Enter the images you love. Don't ever start to think that you've got to start shooting for a judge or something like that. Um, with, with regard to competition, they're useful. You get great feedback. But don't compare yourself to other photographers. See who you were last year. If you're competing in PSA, PPA, NECCC, whatever it is, what were your scores last year? Are they better? So, you know, keep shooting what you love and then compare yourself to who you used to be, not to who you are now. But I think sometimes we think we're on the right track. But then we get kind of rigid. We don't remember that we have to be open-minded. It can be really difficult to make sure that we're not our own worst enemy. 
I've seen pictures sometimes that somebody shows me at a phone and I said, how come you don't have this printed large on your wall? And they say, well, you know, the eagles, you know, his beak isn't quite tech sharp. You know, the eyes are sharp. But the, I'm like, but it's a gorgeous picture. You know, So we forget sometimes that perfectionism can be holding us back. It doesn't always have to be perfect. <laughs> Um, I had somebody come with us at this particular workshop. We we're doing all these hijinks. I don't know if any of you have ever photographed things like this. This is black light. So it's called a hijinks. I mean, someone else kind of sets it all up and you basically go and you kind of trip the shutter. So a lot of competitions won't allow you to submit images that you took on a workshop or that you took that someone else set up. And so some of the photographers that were with us said, well, we're not going to photograph this. And I said, why? And they said, because we can't enter it into competition. I said, well, definitely abide by the rules. Um, if competition says you can't use setups, then you know, don't use setups. If it says you can't use an image you didn't take on a workshop, don't use an image. I said, but how many pictures do you compete a year? And they said, well, about 32. I said, well, how many pictures do you take a year? I take 10,000 pictures a year. Take those pictures for you. Don't choose to enter them into competition, but still take them. Absolutely have fun with them. So I don't know how many of you compete into images. Do you compete in PSA? Do you compete in IPC? Do you compete in a camera club or NECCC? Put in the chat if you compete in images. It's okay. Not everybody does. Um, I found the first year that I started competing, I definitely got good feedback. But sometimes the judges were like, they said, oh, really? You should have a red canoe in the middle of the lake. And I'm like, why there's no canoe so sometimes you have to just throw out what the judges say other times they give you really good feedback and you can learn from them and get to be a better photographer from them you have to kind of take them with a grain of salt when you enter them into competition and you certainly if your goal was say to get on the cover of a magazine and you said well i only shoot landscape pictures well, then you're probably not going to get on a magazine cover because they probably going to want a vertical, right? So sometimes you have to, you know, shoot for the competition or shoot for the judge or shoot for the gallery. But for the most part, shoot for yourself and then enter into competition what you think the judges might actually like. Um, we've done a couple of PPA workshops and a couple of our own workshops down at Eastern State Penitentiary. So this is in Philadelphia and it's a wonderful prison. And in this prison is this red barber chair and everybody takes a picture of the red barber chair. And so sometimes when we lead the workshops, people say, well, I'm not taking a picture of the red barber chair. And I said, well, why not? And they said, because everybody has a picture. And I'm like, well, do you have a picture? So make it your own. So the image on the left, you can kind of just take a regular exposure and just take a picture. Maybe you could do something grungy, like the image on the right and do an HDR or make it look kind of moody and grungy. Maybe you could do something like this, which is an HDR panoramic image. This is actually 77 images stitched together, creating this HDR panoramic. But then I went one step further. Philadelphia is below sea level. All this controversy over climate change and what's going to happen. So I flooded it. And I thought, okay, maybe no one else has this image of the red chair. So make it your own image of the red chair. Kind of have fun with how you're going to take that particular image. Another way you can get into your own head and kind of be your worst enemy is when it's coming up to be winter. I am not a cold weather fan. I much prefer the other three seasons. And so one year we had um, the snow started in Connecticut in the beginning of October. We generally don't get snow until you know Christmas time. And I thought, oh no, like winter's starting in October. Like it's not going to end till April. I'm never going to leave the house. And you start to psych yourself out. And the next day I looked and it's like, wait a minute. It's like a big white softbox out there. It's like this big light box. There's all these subjects just calling to me to be able to photograph them. So I walked outside and I'm photographing the different subjects that are out there and I'm just having a blast with it. So it was going to be snowy, whether I was happy or miserable. So I might as well be happy then, right? I can't change the weather. So you might as well be happy. And whether you liked it straight out of camera, if you brought it back in Photoshop and had some fun with it, have some fun and enjoy that. Well, this particular uh, trip we made to New Hampshire, uh, we woke up in the morning and there was no power in our cabin and there was a couple of feet of snow on the ground. And we were like, wait, we're here to photograph the fall leaves, but it was still beautiful, right? We could have just kind of sat in the cold, miserable cabin and complained or we got out and we were actually out there photographing. This particular day was a really cold January day. And Tom's like, come on, we got to go out. We got to get out. We got to photograph. I'm like, but it's cold. And he's like, come on, let's go. So he's having a blast. He's warm. He doesn't get cold like I do. And finally, I saw this. And I saw the way the water was rippling away and kind of creating these little beings in the ice. 
And so I used the slow shutter speed to get that motion of the water. And then I knew when I got it home, I was going to flip it and reveal the aliens that were in the ice there. So it was just one of these fun things, right? I mean, I could be cold and miserable or I could be enjoying myself. So we're all about as happy as we kind of make our minds up to be. So I make it a point now that, you know, sometimes I'll go out during the snow. Um, This particular day, I made 200 snow ducks. Yes, I have a mold and it makes snow ducks. So I'm out there making these snow ducks and snow ducks and snow ducks, and just having a blast with it. So you have to just kind of psych yourself out and get into a better mindset. You go to photograph flowers and you're expecting a blue sky day and all of a sudden it's a white sky day and there's people around. Change your perspective. If you change your perspective, you can still completely enjoy what's going on in that particular scene. You go to photograph fields of daffodils and you get there and there's a thousand other people photographing these fields of daffodils. So you get down low and you pretend you're a chipmunk. So this is now daffodil from a chipmunk's point of view, right? We have to change our perspective on things because we can't always photograph what we set out to photograph that particular day. Um, out in the Palouse, you know, you're photographing the canola and the wheat and all this wonderful, you know, wonderful landscapes that just go on and on and on with lights and darks. And then all of a sudden, a praying mantis comes and lands on my camera. Well, what do I do? Do I shoo it away? No, he wanted me to photograph it. So I say, Tom, you know, get a piece of wheat off the ground, coax him up onto the piece of wheat. So Tom puts him on the piece of wheat. He's holding it up, photographing him now against the wonderful golden colors. I say, Tom, put it up against the blue sky. And I swear that this praying mantis wanted to be on Instagram because he kind of goes, well, if I look like Count Dracula, maybe he'll put me on Instagram. He was posing for me. But I had to be receptive, right? I had my wide angle lens. I'm thinking about landscapes. Wasn't thinking about photographing little bugs. And this happens quite a bit where all of a sudden I'll be out of place photographing sunset. And all of a sudden this dragonfly in its last dying moment comes over to me and lands on me and wants me to photograph it. I brushed him off and put him on this flower. He came back and landed on me. I put him back on the flower. He came back. He was definitely in his last throes of life. And I finally thought, forget the sunset. He wants me to photograph him. It's just kind of the universe was talking to me. You have to be open-minded enough that you can hear it when it actually comes about. This particular day, we had a workshop group with us. And what are we going to do? It's a rainy day. There's no sunrise going on. We get up really early in the morning and you have this. Um, This is not a black and white image. This is a color image. Right? It was a terrible day for a sunrise. But instead, you can find little bugs that are, you know, there. This little guy is holding on like with his last, last breath. This is what we were expecting that particular day, but we didn't get it that day, right? So you have to then say, I'm going to look for other things. So I became the red leaf fairy and I kind of walked around and in the woods as everybody's trying to make some landscape competitions out of the fog and stuff, I walked around and I'm putting little red leaves all over the place. I'm, you know, getting people to look for just an isolated leaf. I'm having people look for particular things as the forest either laid them there or I put probably 300 leaves in different locations for people to be able to photograph. I found this log and I'm like, it looks like like an alligator. It needs an eye. So I asked one of the workshop participants if I could photograph their eye. I did a multiple exposure in camera. So in camera, I'm lining up the eyeball with that little wooden hole that's there. We're having fun. All right. There's no sunrise, but we can still have a blast. We can still have a lot of fun. What happens if you only bring one lens with you and go for a walk in the woods? You don't have a wide enough lens to be able to take the subject. Well, you're just going to take three images and you're going to stitch them together. So you have to know something about your personality. You have to know something about your camera. You have to know something about Photoshop. You got to know how to hook all these things together so that you can come away with that image because that day you decided just to take a walk in the woods with something that maybe you didn't have that lens that particular day. So sometimes we actually are more creative when we bring less gear. Everybody talks about like the nifty 50, right? If you get into a, you know, a, a real struggle and you're not able to compose and create anymore, put on the lens that maybe you use the least or put on that nifty 50 and make yourself kind of zoom with your feet and make yourself think about compositions more. This particular day, I was at a scientific conference and they gave us an hour free in the afternoon from one to two. And I thought, oh, gee, thanks. Just when the light is best. Right. So I'm walking around, you know, created the snapshot. And then I thought, you know what, if I walk over 90 degrees and I stop down a little bit, I bet I can create something fun out of this. So I walked over 90 degrees. I stopped down to F18 um, and I put the sun right there. And then out of that kind of sculpture in this park in the middle of nowhere, created some art. So again, 
then we can kind of get out of our mindset and have fun and enjoy these types of things. Don't over overlook all those little things that are left behind as you take a walk, as you go into places, you know, an old watering can, silverware that has rind frost on it. We're used to seeing rind frost on leaves. We're not used to seeing rind frost on silverware. So all those things that are kind of left behind. An old shoe that's left behind. One shoe. What happened to the other shoe? What happened to the owner? Why is there a hole in the shoe? So it's still kind of fun to be able to find these. An old car out in the woods. You can just have a blast with these. How about an old pile of, pile of tires? A friend of mine bought, um, her brother bought a, the, our book for us, Create Fine Art, out of kind of rusty things. And he said, I bought the book for, you know, for Mary. He said, and I looked at it before I gave it to her. He says, I never would have dreamed you'd have a pile of tires in a book that has fine art in it. He says, but you managed to be able to do it. Um, you know, something that's left behind. Uh, so, you know, it's a lot of fun to be able to carry around a little LED light. A lot of them now are about the size of our kind of cell phones and we can create shadows with it. And the shadows can be a lot of fun and they add to these things that are just left behind a little bit. You never know what you're going to find if you're kind of open to it and responsive to it. So Wabi Sabi also kind of refers to nature and the cycle of you know, life. We're kind of thinking about fall going into winter right now and those natural cycles that we have, getting outside and looking at all those colors that we actually see in the fall, all of the patterns that we can actually just find randomly if we kind of take a walk. I tend to be drawn to colors like this, colors at opposite ends of the color wheel. So there was all different color cars and all different kind of you know, compositions that I could have photographed, but I tend to be drawn to things like this that are colors at opposite ends of the color wheel. You'll see it in a lot of the art that Tom and I do and in our books, um, these oranges and yellows against the blues, the reds against the greens. It's something that often draws us. This particular one is also interesting because there were snails that have walked along the metal. So the snails are like, doo, 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 doo. they've left these little patterns in there. So you've got kind of wabi-sabi on top of wabi-sabi for that particular one. When fall in, intersperses with winter, you get that wonderful juxtaposition of all that rind frost that you can have. So it can be so much fun just to walk around and notice these. Um, Tom photographed this. It's a thumb screw on our bird feeder in the backyard. And look at the rind frost on this. It's so cool. Um, it kind of looks, um, if you turn it like 90 degrees, maybe like Albert Einstein or a newborn baby or something with all that hair on top of it. It's so cool. So it's stuff that can make you, you know, laugh and have fun. But, you know, you have to stop and notice those types of things. Wabi Sabi can also refer to people. So it can refer to celebrations of our cracks and our crevices, our laugh lines and our scars, our imperfections, fingerprints that maybe are on your refrigerator, or on your sliding glass door, all the other marks that time and weather and loving use have left behind. If you think about it, we think of laugh lines and, you know, all of that, you know, worry lines and all of that is something bad. But if you have laugh lines, it means you had people in your life that made you laugh. If you have worry lines, it means you had people that you had that you love. So you're worried about them. If you have fingerprints on those, you know, on your refrigerator, it means you have little ones in your house. So it's one of these things that absolutely is fun. But it's something that our society doesn't necessarily, you know, appreciate as much that, you know, somebody with this old weathered, you know, fisherman type of look, this gentleman who was whistling as he's walking down the street. I asked if I could take his picture and look, he's got a cataract and he's still, you know, so happy. He's not worried about the worry lines and the laugh lines and the cataracts. He was just happy and going about his day. I asked this woman if I could take her picture and she said, oh, you know, I'm not beautiful. I wish you had known me when I was younger. I was a ballerina. I was beautiful once. And I thought, oh, she's still beautiful. This homeless man asked me after I took his picture if he could see the back of my camera. And when I showed him the back of my camera, he said, oh, I'm still handsome, aren't I? I still got it. And I thought, wow, you know, how wonderful this man had, you know, nothing. He's sitting there on the, on the streets and yet he still is looking at his picture and saying like he still got it. So I did a project um, involving homeless people where I would be asking their permission to be able to photograph them. And this was something that was quite a challenge for me. I had to do what's called a 52 uh, stranger project. So you're basically supposed to photograph, excuse me, 100 stranger project. You're supposed to photograph 100 strangers. And ask, after asking 100 strangers if you can take their picture, you're supposed to be comfortable with it. Well, it didn't quite work, so I did it again. And it didn't quite work. So the third time I made myself photograph 100 strangers in one day. And by the third time, it finally kind of clicked. And before that, I was somebody that would kind of steal somebody's picture. I would actually try to be able to photograph them with a long lens and maybe they wouldn't know. And sometimes they would get very upset. 
And now that I realize that if you think about a homeless person, if somebody showed up in front of your house and you're eating, you know, breakfast out on the porch or you're eating, you know, inside your, your window and somebody starts photographing you, you wouldn't like it. That's your home. Well, the streets are their home. So I decided that I really needed to ask permission. So I called this one the pains of homelessness because I would, as I was talking to these people and asking for permission, if I could take their, um, you know, if asking for permission to photograph them, I also asked, you know, you know, what they used to do. One of these people used to be a photographer. He was a medium format film photographer. He had a studio. He got into a car accident. He did not have health insurance because he was a photographer and self-employed. He lost his house. He lost his family. He lost everything. Ended up on the street. So it was fascinating to be able to talk to them. And when I asked them if I could photograph them, they almost all said yes. Occasionally, there'd be somebody that with clear mental illness would be worried about the government finding them or something. But 99.99% said yes. And I finally realized that when I was asking them if I could photograph them, that asking that permission was to kind of confer importance to them. They were still important enough to be photographed. They were still important enough to be asked if I could photograph them. But it wasn't something that came you know, naturally to me. It was definitely something that I had to work towards. Wabi Sabi can also be kind of the antithesis of Western civilization and Western notion of beauty, which is more perfection, monumental, enduring things. Certainly wouldn't think of bird poop as being you know, artistic, but when I was out photographing the homeless people in um, San Francisco, I was also photographing lots of bird poop, which made people look at me like I was a little strange because I'm now photographing bird poop on the side of the street. But I put this one into a PPA image competition um, and it actually did get a challenge. And one of the judges just like laughed aloud and he said, I've never seen something somebody put bird poop on a restored car before. Like we, we clean it off, we clone it off. So if I can make somebody laugh, that's great. Um, this particular one here was a car that I photographed in Cuba. And when I brought it home, I did some manipulations with it. I did a mirror image and then a polar uh, filter polar uh, coordinates on it. And then put some eyeballs into it. And this actually just won the Scott Kelby Guru Award. So once a year, he does at Photoshop World where he um, awards uh, people, you know, this, so I had two images that were in the finalists and this particular one won the Guru Awards for creativity. So it was a lot of fun to be able to do this type of thing. Here's the plant that is now a four-year-old plant been sitting around in my house for many Christmases and I kept saying one day I'm going to photograph this plant well, I'm home it's a pandemic might as well photograph it so I bring it downstairs and put it on top of my dryer that's where my light painting area was during the pandemic and I used a flashlight to be able to light paint it and then I brought it into Photoshop and created kind of this flower out of it and I thought you know it sat around for that many years I had to do something special with it to be able to be rewarded from it so this is the light painting station that's down on top of the dryer. It's just a dollar piece of mat board and then $4.99 piece of, you know, staples. At our studio, we have a room that's dedicated to light painting, but for a few months we weren't allowed into there. Um, and so this enabled us to be able to get through those months. This is our artist in residence period. This is the time period where we can photograph things that maybe other people don't think about. So creativity is seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. So that very same dryer died during the pandemic. We had to get a new dryer. And so they took the piece of dryer vent out and they left it behind. And I said, oh, I got to light paint that. I got to photograph that. So I used some purple lights and some pink lights. And then I created a dryer vent flower. I thought probably not very many dryer vent flowers out there. So have fun as you're going through this. Think about things that are you know important in your life. You know, toilet paper. Oh, we couldn't find any toilet paper back in March and April. Ah, uh, toilet paper seeds. I'm going to grow some toilet paper. So I planted some toilet paper. Nothing grew. So I'm light painting all of these as I'm going through this storytelling process. And I thought, ah, I know why it didn't grow. It's got to be like a potato. I got to be able to put toothpicks in it and put some water in it. And if I do that, ah, finally be able to grow some toilet paper. And finally, ah, relief, we have toilet paper, right? So anything could be a subject for being able to, to do this. As you're going through your winter, think about doing some light painting. Image on the left is just a straight image. The image on the right, I've now light painted it and directed the light. It takes on a more saturated feel, a more Rembrandt-y feel, a more three-dimensional feel to it. So set up an area where you can actually do some light painting in there. A friend of mine gave me this old piano. It's about a children's size, like maybe for a one or two-year-old. And she said, and I thought if I bought it, I could do something with it, but I really couldn't find anything. And I said, well, I'll light paint it. 
when I light painted it, oh, it came alive. She saw this picture and she's like, can I have it back? You know, so, you know, anything that's around your house, you can take and do some light painting on. Here's some hosta plants. All the chlorophyll's gone. It's the middle of winter. And I just took them and put them on top of the light box. And then I used a purple, bluish color flashlight and I light painted them. You can light paint some food. It can be a lot of fun to be able to light paint food. Um, here's the eggs after Tom made omelets one Sunday morning and light painting those. Some pears, you know, you want to pair up. So now you can have a lot of fun. Um, the farm that was giving us our flowers started to realize that I was a little eccentric. So when she had food that she was calling long in the tooth, she would give us some of these. So these are some pears that were well past prime. And when she gave them to me, I was just like, oh, these are great to be able to photograph. Uh, we got lemons and then I could finally throw away that imposter that was sitting in the refrigerator for so, so long, right? Um, you know, these seeds that are there. So don't let it cause your creativity to go to seed. What's it, right? The pandemic, Omicron, maybe it's winter. Maybe it's your own fatigue at all of this, you know, still be creative. We had absolutely, this is our fork in the road. This is now, you know, it, usually people are really good up until New Year's Eve. And then, you know, oh, what are we going to photograph in January, February, March? You're not somebody that enjoys going outside and photographing snow. Then do all these fun things inside. Get the kids baseball bat out or find one at a flea market or on eBay. You can photograph and do fine art with it. You can go in closer or go in even closer with your macro lens and use it to tell a story. There's all kinds of things that are sitting around your basement, sitting on your mantle. So this is just sitting here, um, something on my, on my mantle. And I took it down, photographed it, did a mirror image, a little bit of a blend, put a texture on it. Take all of these things that are sitting in your attic, sitting on your mantle, sitting in your basement, photograph them. The old bulb. Now I'm getting close on this. This to me looks like the heart and soul, right? We have the red being like the circulatory system and all the blue being all the neurons that are going all over the place. You can photograph all kinds of things that are around, whether it is food, whether it's high key or low key, whether it's straight out of camera or whether it is photoshopped. Have some fun with it. Fall back in love with your camera. Remember back to that first time you tripped the shutter and you enjoyed that image so much. You know, see things in a different light. Look down, look up, slow down, photograph, and hopefully this has enlightened you a little bit of something to be able to do during the rest of this pandemic, the rest of this winter as we're starting into January, February. It is now we're done with the longest day of the year. It is only getting better and better and better as we go on from here, but it's a little ways before spring comes. So thank you very much. I'd be very happy to... Uh, answer any questions that you have about techniques, about inspiration. Also, if you think of a question like a week from now, a month from now, please feel free to email me, you know, uh, message me. Um, if I've inspired you to take a picture, I love to be able to see it. So tag me, send me an email, send me a link to your website. I love to be able to see what people are photographing as well. So please do keep in touch. And uh, Chris, I didn't see too many questions coming through on the chat, but maybe I missed something. But if not, they can certainly add more into there. Ah, so Mary had uh, jaws dropped the entire time, just like, holy cow, you were nonstop. <laughs> I'm surprised you had uh, time to breathe in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marietta did mention, so I am doing an all day version of this for the Connecticut PPA. So it is this program expanded along with some Photoshop techniques, um, something to do with Adobe Camera Raw, which is the same as Lightroom Develop Module, and something to do with mirror imaging. So I am doing an all day version of this. So I think she has put that link into the chat as well. Uh, yes, um, she has. Yep. So somebody said, uh, how do you get the creative juices flowing? So one of the things that I try to do is have a few different personal projects going on. So I'm always thinking of different things that I can be doing to inspire myself. Um, I might take on a project where I'm photographing, you know, um, you know, dead leaves for a little while. I might take on something where I'm bringing a, a toy figure with me and photographing that in a lot of different places. So I have at all times, probably, I don't know, five or six different projects that are kind of going on that'll inspire me. The other thing is just to kind of, again, slow down and be receptive. So you get up in the morning, I am not a morning person. So for me to get up at four o'clock in the morning, get up for sunrise and there's no sunrise. I just want to crawl right back into bed. But instead, I'm going to look around. I'm going to find something to be able to photograph. And I think that slowing down and noticing those types of things that are out and about help you to kind of feed that creative soul. And I think the other part is that 
that perfectionism part, like, right, we all want to learn and we want to do better. And we see someone else's images better than ours or got more likes than ours or scored better in competition than us. We've got to remember that, again, we're going to, you know, competing against ourselves. We want to make sure we're a better photographer than the way we were be- the year before. Don't let yourself get down by seeing someone else's picture and then kind of like, oh, mine's not as good or something. And because that's the killer of creativity is when we get down on ourselves. Trying to be perfect and only looking for that absolute perfect stuff. Well, if you do have questions, um, put them into chat right now. We've got some prizes to give away. Um, so we'll do that. We'll hang on. If anybody has any uh, last minute comments, getting lots of people saying about how wonderful you are. And, and <laughs> I know that was definitely inspiring and quite a treat as we're heading into the holidays there. Uh, so let's look at uh, some of those prizes from uh, American Color Imaging. Um, before we get to that one, uh, they do have a special going on for anybody that's watching and get 35% off of any backgrounds and flooring from Background Town. Um, check your email. The code for doing that is going to be sent out um, in it. But uh, let's give away some prizes because that's fun. Uh, so first up, we've got a $50 lab credit to ACI. Uh, so let's see who our winner is here on this one. I always love giving stuff away. And right on the edge, that is Ron Barbosa. Fantastic. All right. So up next, then, we've got a $75 lab credit. And see who that winner is. Hey, Joanne Murray. Congratulations. And I just saw from Joanne's Christmas card, she just retired this year, her and her husband, Jay, <laughs> from finally doing that. So up next, we've got a $100 lab credit going on. And see who that winner is. And Ronald Holloway. writing that one down so we can make sure that we're getting you guys your prizes that are coming up there. Um, so it doesn't look like uh, we have uh, any questions that are coming through on there. I do want to let you guys know about some of the upcoming episodes that we have. We've got a fun new lineup and you'll notice some new colors and branding that we're going to be introducing for uh, uh, next year. Um, up next is Mike Busby's The Magic and Composition. At Imaging USA we've got the ACI mentor team that's coming together sharing a whole bunch of tips and tricks that are there. And then and in February, we've got Mike Price talking about headshots, kind of a process-driven approach, uh, how he makes things efficient um, that's there. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of exciting. If you are interested in being on the show or you have an idea of a subject matter that you'd really, really like to do, uh, please reach out, email me, hello at cwoolly.com, uh, so we can start talking or find me on Facebook, because that's always fun, too. <laughs> All right, well, I think it's officially holiday season now. <laughs> Are we ready for uh, <laughs> enjoying the holidays, get some uh, fun with friends and family and all of that, Lisa? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Thank you so <laughs> very, very much for being on the show. I know I'm definitely inspired and going to be looking at things quite a bit differently during the holiday season. So uh, that's kind of some fun challenges to put yourself through to look at things in a unique way. Yep. I hope everybody ventures down into their basement or their attic and does something fun in January. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's an official wrap then for 2021 for us. So thank you so very much, Lisa. You're welcome. Thank you, Chris, for having me.